All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by Jun Sung Park. Jun is a PhD student at Stanford University. Before we get going, be sure to take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Jun, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Hey, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. You are working on uh, and in an area that we've been digging into a little bit on the podcast recently, uh, generative agents, and we will uh, go deep into your research in that area. But before we do that, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background with our audience. How did you come to work in machine learning? So when I graduated from college, basically, uh, I was running a startup uh, that wasn't really going to pan out. But one of the really nice things that happened during my first year out of college was I actually moved to Palo Alto area, which is right next to Stanford. Uh, so I was living here for about a year. And during that time, um, one of the things I got really passionate about is sort of this research scene that was going on. So I've been running this startup for about half a year. And we, my co-founder, I had one other co-founder, me and my co-founder sort of realized it wasn't really going to pan out, but we sort of along the way found a lot of different passions. And one of the things that I found was basically something like research uh, in AI, uh, especially in AI field and in computer science, seems to share a lot of similarities as to creating a startup or creating a piece of art in that we sort of delve into it. We have an idea that we want to pursue and you take responsibility over it. And you basically try to express what your thoughts are about that particular topic. So it was around then I joined Stanford's uh, computer science department as sort of this visiting student researcher or kind of vis visiting researcher. So I was already, I had graduated from undergrad. Um, and I started working with a professor here named James Landay. So James is now the associate director of uh, the institute that we call HAI. It's H-A-I. So that's Human AI Institute at Stanford. And it was the era where, when we were just thinking of creating that. So it, so James and Fei Fei and some other faculty members here were really getting excited about this new opportunity that we had with AI technology that was just coming about. And I was sort of watching James from the side as I was working with him and uh, other faculty member here, Jeff Hancock, and who and a PhD student back then who is now a professor at UPenn at the name of Texas. So I was sort of working with them and seeing from side what they were getting really passionate about, uh, because that's one of the ways I like to find new interesting areas to work on, basically finding really passionate people who are really smart and seeing, trying to see what they're seeing into the, in the future, in the five to 10 year uh, time horizon. So that's how I got interested in AI. And in particular, sort of the angle that I got particularly interested in was back then, as you can imagine from this Human AI Institute, this was an institute that cared in particular a lot about human and our role with technology and the way we use technology. The underlying philosophy here is we seem to have this really powerful new piece of technology, AI, that can do a lot of different things, right? And the question then became, it would the uninspiring answer to what we're going to do with, of course, with this technology is, hey, we'll just do better classification or slightly better content moderation that improves the performance by a touch. That's sort of the, uh, that could be still interesting, but from the interaction perspective, a little bit less inspiring. So what I wanted to answer in that area in particular was basically ask, well, what can we really do with them? Um, and so that's how I got into AI. A part of that journey is trying to envision what, my, what our future might look like with AI technology but also getting a little bit more technical and go deep into what's actually possible and where we think there is a limitation, see if we can push the limitation and boundaries so we can leverage this new interactive opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is your uh, particular area of, of interest from a research perspective at um, kind of the intersection of like, do you incorporate traditional HCI, human computer interaction types of approaches into your research, or is it more grounded on the computer science side of things? Not that, I don't know, maybe that's a, an, a, a false dichotomy, but uh, I'll pass it over to you. So it's an interesting question, and it's a bit of a mix. In And looking back, it's one of those things that we don't really think about too much, in that we basically use a tool 
that seems to be the best for the moment. And ultimately the goal here is to create something that people enjoy and can empower people. So that's sort of what we're trying to achieve. The way this sort of comes up in, in sort of my conversation, one way that I think that defines a lot of my research, um, regardless of what technique we use, is we like to identify some of the existing problems or challenges that lasted for many decades sometimes and trying to see if we can solve them now. And a lot of the challenges challenges that we identify are challenges from your sort of traditional HCI and AI field. So certainly with generative agents, one of those main challenges actually was, can we create believable agents? Agents that can interact with other agents and other users in a human-like manner in an open world over a long period of time. And that was sort of the vision that HCI certainly had for a long time. Uh, so think back to people like Alan Newell and Herbert Simon when they were creating cognitive architectures and cognitive models uh, in the very early days of both AI and HCI when these two fields used to be a little bit together, right? We had this cognitive psychology uh, folks who were really trying to pioneer that area. So we kind of look back to those eras and try to see, they had a lot of really interesting visions that we sort of forgot about and try to see, well, can we crack them again? So in that way, that's how a lot of sort of HCI and traditional AI literature informs me. It informs me of what are sort of, sort of the lost vision that we had in the long arc of our journey here and what are the new techniques that can really solve them. And of course, the techniques are much more grounded in more recent progress we had in AI. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to ask about that. When you got started, generative AI was not the same term as it is today. Uh, how has the uh, evolution of generative techniques impacted the way you approach your research? So in a more narrow sense, if you're thinking about something like generative agents, Generative AI, especially I'm talking about large language models in this particular instance, although other multi-model models can also come into play here in the future. The part that really interested us in the early days was this observation that these models seem to have been trained on broad data that include the social web, Wikipedia, and so forth. So they actually encode something really deep and meaningful about human behavior. So if you poke it at the right angle, it kind of knows the way we behave, the way we like to talk to each other, and so forth. And that presents a new opportunity in terms of how to design these NPC characters, uh, these chatbots, and so forth. In the past, if you look to how we used to do this, it was a lot of manual coding or manual authoring. And even in game industry today, that's what you often see. Kind of like rules engines or things like that. That's right. Uh, the rules, behavioral tree, uh, even state machines, um, these are all still the techniques that we use today. What's interesting about these models, though, is because they are aware of so many different contexts, it knows how an artist might behave before, let's say, a deadline, or how a student like myself might behave when there's a paper deadline coming up. It knows a lot about this, or what we might do to do, finish our morning routines, like waking up, brushing our teeth, uh, cooking breakfast and so forth. So we have a single model that seems to encode all this. So we can just ask this model how somebody with this characteristics and experience might behave around this. And that was sort of the new opportunity that we saw in this instance. So one of the, the, one of the kind of big questions that's come about since the, you know, with the rise of and the rise in popularization of large language models, chat G GPT, et cetera, is this question of whether they have a worldview, which seems uh, particularly germane to not just what you've talked about, but the context of, um, you know, of open worlds and games and, and things like that and how an agent might behave in those kinds of worlds. Uh, based on your research, you know, how do you think about and answer that question? This sort of comes up. So when you say worldview, I'm, I'm looking more towards the direction of sort of the, uh, what are sort of the values that were encoded in these, in these models and so forth. Is that sort of the angle that you're looking at? I think that's part of the open question is what exactly do we mean by worldview and like different people answer it in different ways. I think, you know, some Times the question is taken to mean, you know, do these things have like, do, does the large language model have what we might call common sense? Sometimes it means, does it have um, a, a perspective on 
you know, the way the world operates that's similar to, you know, a human-like perspective on the way the world operates. Uh, it seems like your the the premise of your research in many ways is that, you know, these models do bring a worldview to, um, you know, to the agent that you're trying to create. So this is this is an interesting question, and this is something that we sort of ask ourselves all the time. And in the field, of course, recently there seems to be paper after another where one paper seems to say, "Hey, this this agents or these models actually have a worldview. They have common sense, and they have all this theory of mind." And another paper comes in and say, "Actually, if you change this parameter a little bit or change the prompt a little bit, that all goes away. So maybe not." So I agree. It's a both the question and the answer here seems a little bit open-ended for me. Uh, I can sort of say like what we uh, in this particular project assumes and kind of go beyond that a little bit and try to see what I'm sensing in this. So we do assume that these agents or these models, uh, ChatGPT4, ChatGPT and these models, encode human behavior. And I think that much I think is fairly... Concrete. Now, the question is, whose behavior, what types of behavior do these uh, language models encode? I think it's a really important uh, question that we continue to need to an uh, ask and answer. But it is, I think, the case that these models encode human behavior because we can actually prompt it and we can extract it. And there has been our work, certainly, but there has been another small now group of work in this domain that basically tries to much more empirically answer this question. And they seem to be getting sort of a similar answer. So you can get these models to behave like human participants in certain contexts, and it will give you the responses that sort of match the human behavior in many ways. So that's what we assume. Now, there is sort of a sort of a deeper question here as to do these models have common sense? Do these models, let's say, have theory of mind? And it's one of those things where one thing to note, of course, is all the, the model's capacity oftentimes is sort of emergent, or that's the term that we've been using recently. Although, wasn't, isn't there just a paper? I think there's some paper that just came out that talks about the, uh, there not being emergent behaviors in LLMs. Right. I, I, I am trying to remember. So I think that was the paper by uh, my colleagues here, uh, led by, as I think the faculty was Samli, uh, whom, which is, was sort of interesting. Uh, Samli and I briefly overlapped at UIUC, which is where I got my master's in computer science. And, uh, and he was a professor back then. He was a really cool professor that uh, I, I knew a lot of his work and I looked up to the things he was doing. And then, and I never really got to chat with him when I was there. And now we're both here and it's, it's kind of cool connection. It's, Right, so there was certainly that paper, and I, I think it. So one of the argument I believe that paper is trying to make was a lot of this emergent behavior. The argument that we're trying to make is if we were to basically measure a certain performance of some task on these models, the performance all of a sudden goes up when it passes a certain threshold uh, in terms of let's say the number of parameters or nodes it has and so forth. And I think what this new paper basically was trying to say is, well, you know, you can actually, depending on what metric and how you use them, how you scale them, you can actually map uh, this basically emergent behavior in a much more predictable manner. So it becomes a much more linear function, uh, which is, again, much more predictable. And much less emergent. Right, much less emergent because... It's more like a scaling law than emergence kind of thing. Exactly. So I'm still trying to wrap my head around. So of course, this paper had come out very recently. I, I saw this kind of trending both at Stanford and on Twitter like in the last week. So I think we as a field is sort of trying to figure out what that means. Um, I think a part of it still remains true where, at least for now, it does appear to be the case. There's, there's a lot of surprise element. So whether these behaviors truly emergent, I think is going to be another really interesting question to ask. What appears to be true is at least we, as a community, didn't expect a lot of this behavior. And whether they're predictable or not, we are finding out about them in ways we sort of, a lot with our classic AI systems, we didn't have to. So certainly one thing that is changing is our relationship with these models and AI systems, where in the past, we sort of modeled them and we had a very specific task in mind that we wanted, we wanted to tackle. But now it is still the case that a lot of these behaviors and capacities 
we are finding out after the fact, after we have sort of developed these models. And that leaves sort of this interesting questions as to what do these models contain? Do they contain a worldview? To some extent, they might. To some extent, they don't. And the way I've been sort of coaching in a lot of my work is go about it in a very empirical manner. And this is where I think some of the interaction community uh, likes to differ uh, compared to some of the more, much more AI-focused communities. And I think both have a lot of values to offer here. For the interaction community, sort of the, the problems that we're trying to solve is very much grounded in the human problem that we are aware of. So, for instance, um, if we have machine vision system that can do really good image recognition, that can help people with blindness or sight impairment to basically take photos and try to understand what's uh, in their surroundings. So there has been really interesting work from people like Jeff Bigham, who was trying to tackle those kind of tasks. And in that kind of environment, in that mode of thinking, what you care the most about is, is the AI system good enough for that particular idea or task? And that's sort of the mode of thinking that I sometimes uh, like to take, where we had a task for generative agents. These are agents that you know we wanted to see if they can exhibit human behavior that's sort of believable. And believable is the term that we've been using because we're not actually promising uh, with these agents. And I think this is sort of not just our work, but I think that's been the case with a lot of this uh, human behavior related work around large language models. Right now, a lot of it plays around this idea of believability. So can, can we predict, let's say one of, one of the ideas that we present with generative agents is we can simulate a human society or the small society of NPCs. Now, do their behaviors predict human society and their outcome remains to be seen. Uh, what appears to, to be the case is when we look at them, when a human participant looks at them, they are sort of believable in that they seem plausible. Like we can imagine something like this happening. Is, is the thing that you're looking to imagine happening the behavior of the agents, the responses of the agents to stimuli, the evolution of the world that the agents create. Like there's all kinds of things that you could apply a believability test to in this environment, which I understand is kind of like the Sims or inspired by the Sims. Um, what, which of those are you focused on from a believability perspective? And then how do you even go about measuring uh, that so that you can, you know, baseline benchmark all the things that you'd want to do as part of a research study? So in terms of kind of like what uh, aspect of believability do we really want to understand, there's sort of two parts to this. Um, one is much more straightforward and one is much more ambitious. Uh, the straightforward one is, do these agents create believable behavior in a very narrow segment in time within a very small setting? So let's say uh, June woke up in the morning uh, and he needs to get to the office. What does he need to do? And believable behavior, there might be, well, Jun just woke up, so maybe he will you know, quickly finish his morning routine, pack, and in this particular instance, maybe I walk to campus. Highly believable. Now, what wouldn't be believable is, let's say, you know, Jun go, gets on a uh, space ro rocket and then flies to Sanford campus. That's a little bit out there. So that's clearly not believable, but something like, you know, morning routine, walking, sure. And that's sort of the, uh, the level one of believability. And that large language model seems to do really well. And I think our study and many other studies, or I wouldn't say many other studies, but studies that are now becoming interested around this idea, we're showing that that is certainly the case. Is believability in, in, in this context constrained by or a product of the environment, meaning you know, do you have a rocket there that the agent could use or is, you know, does the agent have a, you know, a shower, a coffee maker and a toaster and therefore the things that the agent does is interact with what's in its environment and it's kind of, you know, believability is conferred by the environment as opposed to, you know, the agent's decisions. Uh, and the, it definitely is. The context and sort of the, the agent's environment plays a huge factor in believability. Uh, now, there are some boundaries here. 
uh, one just with our common sense, it would be pretty unreasonable for somebody to get on a plane to go to five minute distance. Maybe somebody does, uh, but it seems quite unlikely. So there's a little bit of probability distribution playing in here as well, but the environment also is a huge factor. Um, and that's sort of uh, the level one. Um, and going a little bit beyond that, there's a lot of uh, interest around how these believable agents uh, act as sort of the stateless uh, personas. So one of the sort of the precursor paper that we wrote before generative agent was called Social Simulacra. And there we wanted to ask, here's one setting in a social media conversation. Let's say it's a community for artists where people talk about their artistic ideas and new tools to use and so forth. What would this person say? What would another person reply to that post? Or what would a troll do? So we can basically teach uh, developers or moderators what could happen in such a community. And Lars Lange's model was actually quite good at reproducing a lot of this behavior. And that was interesting. And that's where we sort of see the most, uh, if in terms of evaluation, that's sort of where we saw the most progress. We were able to create this behavior. We've been evaluating it and they seem believable to human participants. Now, the more ambitious goal that we have in this line is in a multi-agent setup, for instance, can these agents exhibit believable emerging community behaviors at scale? So what that might mean is we demonstrated 25 agents in our particular demo for the, the work that we're talking about, where these NPCs were walking around and communicating with each other and going about their days. Now, sort of the simplest emergent behavior. Now, there's been some debate around whether it is emergent behavior is sort of the right term to use in this particular instance. But for now, uh, I stick with it. And then we can discuss what that might mean if that uh, comes around. But here, sort of the emergent behavior that we describe was in three forms, information diffusion, relationship formation, and action coordination. So do these agents spread information amongst each other? Uh, so if there's an uh, election going on, do they hear about this election and who's running in it? Uh, do these agents form relationships? So after a day, is there new agents that this agent now knows that they interacted with and do they remember? And do they coordinate? Right? So if there's a party going on. Do they actually send invitation and actually gather for the party? And these are sort of the initial sets of emergent behavior within this community where what's interesting is now this actually to some extent the philosophy here actually is heavily related to agent-based modeling uh, which is still a popular technique in especially in computational social science where we have a very simple equation that models the behavior of a single agent and tries to understand sort of the large-scale behavior of a collective and that's sort of, sort of what, what we're interested in in this particular instance as well, where what we are designing is a single agent, right? Here's an agent uh, that behave in certain ways, they remember and they act in this way, in this game world. That's the only thing we've designed. So we didn't say anything to the system or our AI agents about these collectives, but they can still gather around and actually exhibit the three forms of in, uh, emergent behavior and we in particular focus on these three forms of behavior because that's what we know from social science studies that humans also exhibit. And what we find is you can design this single agent really well and replicate the known human behavior as a collective. So that's sort of the next layer that we want to get to. Now within our study, we sort of showed that again in sort of this kind of like, a, I would still consider it to be like maybe level 1.5, right? Where we basically simulated these agents for two days. We see information to fusion, action coordination, and relationship formation. And that, that was sort of very interesting for our paper. And when it happened, we were really excited when we saw that. Now you can take this further. Is sort of uh, what I'm sort of excited by right now. And I'm, this is not the perfect example. And I'll say why in just a minute. But imagine if we can run a simulation that last many decades. Um, and let's say at the beginning, we set it to prehistoric uh, historic era before all the monetary system and whatnot. If we just let these agents run, do they come up with a monetary system on their own so they can trade with each other and so forth? 
That, if we can see that, that's sort of the next level of this sort of emergent behavior that would be truly fascinating. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is maybe not the perfect example, and this is going back to this idea of evaluation for our work and a lot of work in sort of uh, in this space that we're still trying to tackle and wrangle with, which is when we see a behavior, like be believable behavior that are generated by a large language model, it is sometimes unclear whether they are succeeding in this evaluation because what they're generating is believable human behavior or whether because they sort of memorize something in their data set. So if they create monetary system, is it because that truly emerged from their human-like behavior or is it because in the training data, there was information about the monetary system and that was sort of a natural path? And that is an interesting question for us to keep on asking. Uh, we have, there are some groups of people now trying to tackle that, uh, and we are also thinking critically about that problem. In some sense, it's really super interesting if they could effectively implement a monetary system, even if they didn't generate the idea uniquely. Um, if they could somehow implement that in this world, that in and of itself is interesting, but it's not, you know, evidence of them kind of collaborating and coming up with the idea of trade and, um, you know, building a monetary system from scratch. It's kind of two separate, uh, two separate tasks or dimensions. And from interaction perspective, I think both are interesting and useful in that if you want to see how a troll might behave in a social media site, then it, we are actually explicitly leveraging the fact that these models have seen a lot of this troll behavior. And that's really useful because that lets us think critically about what could happen in known communities that we need to design around. So that still is interesting and useful. But as you're mentioning, if we want to really show that these are emergent and human-like behavior, then we also need to think about, well, can they create new behaviors uh, that we can predict, but we haven't seen in our training data? So does this, you know, going back to this, this question about uh, you know, me measurement and benchmarking, does this mean that the, this kind of direction of research is kind of fundamentally very subjective and, you know, you set these agents out and then, you know, you as a researcher look and say, oh, you know, they look to be believable um, versus not, you know, and if that's the case, um, you know, does it, does it imply that this, um, you know, how, how might you compare what you're doing to another method, like, or, or is that even the point? There's two layers to this. So first layer, so right now, and, and when I say two layers, let me answer this from more of a individual agent perspective or from small group perspective, like small groups of agent. And then there's this perspective of large collective behavior. And the way we go about studying both of them slightly differ, even in social science, when we study humans, like actually humans in our human communities. So I'll take on from there. Now, when we're trying to sort of study the smaller groups of individuals, what do they do in the morning? Like, do they cook breakfast? That's, and a lot of those assessment or evaluation, to some extent, is human evaluation. Now, there are rigorous ways to achieve that. Um, so in a lot of human-centered studies or human competition studies, basically, we bring in human participants under certain conditions. It's a lot like psych experiment in some sense, where we try to put human participants who are not us. Um, so we recruit them from online. So it's any, kind of like, uh, any, any person with experience living as human. They look at these agents and try to decipher themselves. Can I see, can I, in some cases, one of the studies that we ran was sort of a dispersion of Turing test. We bring in a random participant. Can that participant tell whether this is human generated or machine generated? And we can get statistical power from those kind of studies. So that's the accepted sort of the uh, uh, method in a lot of human computation studies. And we rely on them as well. So generative agents certainly rely on that kind of evaluation. Um, and our prior work, Social Simulacra, also relied on that kind of evaluation. And to some extent, uh, yes, it is human evaluation again. So it is how our participants thought about these agents. Except we can run, again, the statistical test at scale. So that's, 
how we study these smaller groups, one agent, how, how an agent might behave in the moment and so forth. If you scale it up, however, the question I think becomes a little bit different. The way we study large collectives of people oftentimes is through modeling and statistical methods. So one of the things that we see, of course, most often, or most recently, the, the most sort of a salient uh, form of study was for, let's say, pandemic, right? How would virus uh, spread across a populace? Uh, that becomes much more uh, of a modeling question. Can we model that behavior of that diffusion? And can we predict its diffusion? And that's how we often study collectives. And my guess right now is once we are able to simulate really large collectives of these agents and we want to see whether their behavior is human-like as a collective, a lot of those modeling and statistical methods will come back. And we'll be comparing how information diffuse, let's say, amongst people versus amongst these agents. And what kind of coordination emerge? That can also be answered to some extent, right? Because we have, for instance, a lot of information about polarization in our communities. Do these agents also form those kind of polarization within their communities? And that's something that we can much more concretely answer with something like a statistical model. And I think that's an interesting area of study in the future. Early on in this conversation, you alluded to the role of memory for these agents. Can you elaborate on uh, on where memory comes in and what the role is uh, when you're thinking about um, the, you know this kind of plausibility task? The, there's two parts to memory. So we have what we call the memory stream, which is basically a long-term memory module that include everything an agent has experienced. And then what might be sort of considered as a scratch memory or a short-term memory space. In the paper, we basically just describe it, describe it as retrieve memory. And the way they play in is, let's say in this conversation that we're having right now, I should remember what my research area is. I should remember the paper I wrote so I can be, you know, I can create this meaningful conversation. Uh, and that's sort of what the memory module to some extent is trying to do. It's trying to make sure that these agents maintain long enough context so that it can be used in the future. Now, if we didn't have memory, what that basically would mean is we would need to feed in everything an agent has ex ever experienced into the prompt. And there's sort of two or three reasons why that's not really a good idea. One, right now, it's really not possible. Now, there's been some really exciting work uh, recently that basically extended the prompt, the context limitation. So there's a number of characters that can go into a GPT-4 or ChatGPT prompt. There's work that's coming out that raised it to truly a significant amount. A million tokens is the number that I'm hearing. And that's a lot. That's way beyond uh, what ChatGPT and these models provide right now. So I think there is some interesting work to be had there. And I, I love that paper. And I think it's fascinating. And that's sort of an interesting way. And that's certainly one way to get it. Every time an agent has to make decision, uh, they would basically prompt this language model with their entire life experience. Right now, that is not possible. Right, with, with the known sort of with the APIs that are available today. Now, in the future, with papers like uh, this, would that become possible? Maybe. Right. Even million token, I'm going to pause it, is actually not enough to contain one, time, one person's life experience. So I think there's going to be some limitation, but I think the vector is pointing us towards a future where the token limitation will truly relax if we need it to. But there's another question here do we want to relax that? in the first place. And I'm not so sure about that in the sense, so there are applications where relaxing this token limitation will truly be beneficial and transformative for sure. If your goal, however, is to build human-like agent, it's less clear to me that that is the case for two reasons. One is we make decisions and we process information at an extremely high rate. Every sentence I say is new information coming in. Every sentence I hear is new information coming in. And, and in each of those instances, I need to make decisions on how I'm going to behave. I drop my cup. I need to decide on what to do. 
So it's going to be highly inefficient from the time perspective to have to reconsider all my life choices when I need to decide what I'm going to do when I drop my cup, right? And there's also the computational aspect here as well. The cost also increases. So that's one. So I think that's one reason why having sort of this long-term memory module is sort of an interesting way to talk about this, where it is the way to bypass the need to basically put in all of the life experience of a person into a prompt to reason about. And one more element that I quickly mentioned here is there's been a lot of interesting work. So think chain of thoughts uh, paper uh, and so forth, or think step-by-step -step paper, where... The idea here is these language models often get distracted by unnecessary information and they perform better, especially when we make some of the reasoning processes explicit in their output and in their prompt. And that's what, to some extent, something like a uh, long-term memory uh, allows you to leverage, right? So you could put in basically so in our conversation right now, I could be thinking about what I ate for breakfast two weeks ago. Now, that's not exactly relevant. And now it may have become relevant because now I'm talking about this. But up until now, that's not really relevant. Um, and it is certainly distracting, especially when we're trying to prompt a model with, sort of, uh, with such information. If, on the other hand, you can much more selectively retrieve the portions of memory that matters the most for the moment, then that's going to make the reasoning process much more explicit and much more narrow to up the performance of these agents. So it, that, those are the reasons why I think this, we were particularly interested in implementing this memory module. Um, and the idea that we had to retrieve certain pieces of memory from long-term memory and put it into short-term memory, that was our sort of the motivation behind, behind all that. Is the, the specific, the actual mechanism that you use to implement that, is that a, an interesting uh, discussion point or was it just some kind of text blob that the agents would have access to? So I think there's a few things that I quickly highlight here. I, I, I highlight two things. One is sort of what does that long-term memory, like that database look like because it's different than what we had in the past and how do we retrieve it? Now, What's unique? The opportunity that we found with this work is, so we went in to, when we were creating this memory stream, which is again, the long-term memory module, we went in more from the, you know, AI research uh, researchers perspective today. So we decided at first, hey, can we use Knowledge Graph? Because that's really popular and powerful. So Knowledge Graph is this graph, of course, that has uh, object, uh, predicate, and subject that connects different nodes. It's kind of a compelling idea. You have these these memories. You want them connected to each other in different ways, and you want to be able to traverse that um, to maybe create an experience or recall an experience or something. Is that the, the idea? That's exactly the idea. And especially because a lot of this information that we need to retrieve are associative, right? Uh, so knowledge graph certainly made a lot of sense at first. So we went in, what we found uh, was knowledge graph still can work, I think there's, so I think it could, it's entirely possible that some other researchers might come in and try to implement generative agents with a knowledge graph and it could still work well and maybe might have different strength. But what we found in our work is using, knowledge, using a very structured database actually downplays the opportunity or the strength we have with a large language model. A large language model can, can basically parse natural language really well. So we can actually create a database that's really simple. It's just lines of text, just lines of natural language text, and that is it. And we just retrieve different lines during different moments as we need. And we found that to work surprisingly well. So that, that is the structure of uh, our database. And this is kind of a theme for this entire architecture where the core medium that connects all different modules, memory and planning, reflection, everything, is everything can run in natural language. It's text. And was the, the, the world itself, the interactions in the world itself were fundamentally text-based or did you have to 
go from text to, you know, uh, some command structure or some interaction structure or something else? So that was also mostly in text. So the, gr the grounding uh, of these agents happened in text. So they will reason about everything in natural language. So all the way from, I want to cook breakfast. Where should I go? Or what are the locations that I'm aware of? That reasoning happens in text. And at the last moment, we translate that into an action in the game engine. So if an agent is in their, let's say, bedroom and they need to go to the kitchen, let's say, to cook, then we can use a game engine to move this agent from one location to another. And there's a little bit more detail that I think is a little bit more of implementation detail where each of these agents basically contain a tree or a really basic form of scene graph that lets them know which, uh, what object is where so they can reason about that. But all the reasoning itself is done in natural language with a large language model. So that was sort of the interesting finding or philosophy that we have where, well, can we really leverage natural language to an extreme? One last thing I'll quickly mention is uh, the retrieval function. Um, I, I sort of mentioned two things about the retrieval function, which is another in interesting aspect of how we develop this memory module. So that's the one that takes things from long-term memory into the short-term memory. That's what decides what's important in the moment. Our retrieval function has three aspects, uh, or it's a combination of three variables, recency, relevance, and importance. Recency is just an exponential uh, function, so or exponential decay function. So the more recent element are more likely to be retrieved. That's something we, you know, we all are familiar with. Um, the relevance function is another one that's sort of all familiar to us. Uh, it's basically cosine similarity of embeddings uh, of the text in memory and the current context. So we're doing this podcast interview about generative agents, then I'm going to bring in relevant pieces of, of information that's about generative agents. The last element was sort of interesting. Uh, it's called importance. How salient or how poignant is a certain event? So for instance, what I ate for breakfast two weeks ago, not really said, I already forgot about what I ate, not really important, it's somewhat trivial. So those will be scored really low. But I broke up with someone or I graduated, that's a really salient moment for a lot of people, and that scores really highly. And so is this implemented as like a, a novelty score that the LLM produces, or surprise score or something? That's basically right. It's, we, it's a prompt that literally asks the agent or the model, this happened, how important is this to you? And that worked surprisingly well. Um, and that was sort of the last opportunity that we found in there. So that's our retrieval function. One thing I will note is with this particular work, what we wanted to present is more of a framework of thinking about such a retrieval function. And we think those three variables are going to be sort of important. We think those are sort of the sensible uh, variables to use. And certainly recency, relevance, these are variables that we as a community already know a lot about. Going forward, however, uh, there's a huge literature, there's an entire community of information retrieval uh, community uh, who are experts in this kind of tasks. And I think there's a lot more value that can be added to something like a retrieval function if we can leverage the community's knowledge. And in our work, um, it was more of a just it was more of a framework. Uh, so we basically implemented this retrieval function to be something relatively simple and, com and easy to communicate but there's a lot more you can do in this space is our perspective on this. So you're calling out the importance of the retrieval function. You're not saying that these are the three end all be all components of it, but rather they get you pretty far and kind of we can pull in from adjacent areas to figure out if there are other useful elements of it. Yep, that's right. Uh, with, a, with an asterisk, we do think these three elements, so our opinion right now is that these three elements are going to be important. So a lot of the future retrieval function, if we had to guess, we'll have them. And things like the importance function that we have here is interesting because it's a prompt and we that's sort of, a, that's sort of new or that feels fresh. Uh, so we think these could be interesting, but rest is exactly as you said. Yeah, yeah, it's the importance 
thing makes me think of conversations conversations that I've had with folks that are working on the cognitive science side that talk about how human memory is kind of conditioned by, you know, some degree of surprise or, um, you know, novelty. Uh, so that um, is, is uh, consistent there. But, you know, my immediate thought was maybe you're doing some, you know, some kind of probability distribution and, uh, and implementing it based on uh, something like that. And just, you know, oh, well, let's just ask the LLM. It's awesome. <laughs> It's been a, uh, it's been interesting to see how much uh, we can offload to a large language model and how well they actually do in practice. Did you um, do ablation studies around the particular LLM that you used, or uh, did you use Alpaca or something like that? Like, what did you use, and and how specific to the LLM was your research result? So. We use ChatGPT, so for the API, that's basically, I believe, uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo is the one that we used. Um, now, it is an interesting question, though, as to whether the language model that we used uh, is going to impact the way these agents behave. And they, to some extent, they will. And to some other extent, they may not. Uh, so we originally implemented this entire architecture first with GPT-3 because GPT, uh, chat GPT wasn't a thing when, or was just becoming a thing during the early stage of this project implementation. And then during the last month or two of the project, my advisors, uh, Michael and Percy uh, mentioned, hey, can you um, change this with chat GPT because we're getting a little bit behind. And, uh, and we did. And so there was one or two all-nighters where we tried to re-implement everything with ChatGPT, but that's sort of the process. But that is to say, it works with GPT-3 as well. Was that kind of a, you know, a buzz capture bandwagon thing? Or was it, you know, either, you know, was it intuition or, or was it principled like, hey, uh, the RLHF process is going to aid the performance of the, the agent or both. I mean, <laughs> honestly, it was a little, little bit of both. One certainly was we've been using ChatGPT in, in different contexts and we were impressed. We, these, uh, ChatGPT was much better at listening to a lot of instructions and perform better on some benchmarks that we cared about. And we thought, hey, if we can implement this with ChatGPT, it would be better. And that was the case. It was certainly better. And then there was this element where, well, we want to demonstrate the system with sort of the most popular model. Um, and the most popular model was becoming ChatGPT, so it made sense. Got it, got it. And it's, uh, just to recap, it's an open question as to the sensitivity of the results to the, the LLM because you've not tested others yet. That's right. You need another all-nighter or two to, to introduce another... Uh, another uh, model. So just to, to kind of recap, like this research kind of explores uh, broadly the behavior of LLM based agents in SIM style uh, environments, which interestingly, they're, you know, graphical environments, but the interactions are fundamentally text based in nature, it sounds like. Uh, and you found that the agents uh, that kind of, you know, behaviors emerge, whether we call them emergent behaviors or whatever, um, you know, they, you know, will communicate with one another about events and other things that, um, you know, suggests kind of, you know, social behavior that um, comes from the language model as opposed to you programming it into these agents. Um, and, you kind of propose that, you know, they're, what is the ultimate conclusion of the research in your words? Well, the conclusion or the message that we want to have um, is we believe that we can actually now start thinking about building these agents, uh, building human like a believable agents. Uh, this was something that we as a community wanted for quite some number of decades. And in the past decade, what we've seen is we sort of abandoned it for the right reason, uh, we didn't have the right angle to tackle this. It was too difficult. It couldn't be manually authored. And, and that was sort of the main way we had. We see a new opportunity. 
And I think it's an interesting area that's opening up for us. Got it. So the 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 upside here is that you know for the first time with LLMs as kind of this fundamental tool, you know we've got something that can get us to plausible agents, agents that behave in human plausible agents that exhibit behavior um, that is kind of plausibly like human behavior uh, without. Um, well, not without, like we've not been able to do it before because, you know, rules are hard and cumbersome and, you know, how do you encode human behavior and rules anyway, you know, but now like we're kind of there with LLMs and the next steps are, um, you know, for example, the, I forget the term you use, but the, um, you know, what's the right retrieval function. And, you know, what are some of the other, you know, memory, how do we implement memory? And like, there's, you know, there's a bunch of like mechanisms around this LLM core that we, you know, are yet to kind of figure out. Um, but you've kind of dem demonstrated that LLMs can do this thing that we've been trying to do for a really long time. That's right. Cool. Well, June, thanks so much for taking the time to share, uh, share this research with us and um, kind of talk through this exciting area. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>